Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Hey guys, it's Darren. Welcome back to the Touch MBA podcast. This week, I brought on Sachin Titnis from the HKU MBA program. We talk about the recent protests in Hong Kong and how that has affected the MBA program. We also talk about updates to the curriculum, to careers, to admissions. So definitely stick around for that part. And at the very end of the episode, Sachin and I discuss kind of the differences between you know, the full-time MBA program, the six specialized master programs that HKU offers, as well as their eMBA program. And who should apply to, to what types of programs, especially if you're on the border of each, right? Maybe you have 10 years of experience and you're not sure, well, should I apply for an MBA or an eMBA? And also, yeah, whether you're a couple years out of uni and you're not sure whether to get a specialized master's or an MBA as well. I think he he shares some really good information there. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Remember, you can get free school selection help at touchmba.com. And do check out my previous interviews with Sachin, episode number 127 and episode number 65. Those two episodes will give you a fantastic idea of what HKU is looking for and how you can really give yourself the best shot of getting into this program. We also have a guide that compares the best MBA programs in Hong Kong. Just Google best MBA uh, Hong Kong touch MBA and you'll find that guide. My next guest is now the senior executive director of marketing and admissions for the MBA program, the EMBA Global Asia program, and six specialized master programs at Hong Kong University, or HKU. He's also been on the show a couple of times, so I always enjoy our chats. Sachin Tipness, welcome back to the Touch MBA podcast. Thank you, Darren. It's always wonderful to talk with you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Yes, and I'm really looking forward to this talk. So, Sachin, I would be remiss if I didn't first ask you about the Hong Kong protests and how they've affected, you know, your programs at HKU. Right. So uh, I guess what we see in the media uh, sometimes uh, might not give a very uh, clear picture about what is happening on the ground. So just to let all our viewers know, uh, our classes, uh, our operations, everything is going on as smooth as what it was even before. Uh, any of this started. So in terms of disruptions to the class or the community, uh, there's, I would say, very bare minimum or uh, not at all as such. But yes, there is a situation which we need to be aware of. Uh, We need to uh, look at it. uh, And we look at it from a very positive angle. And why do we do that? You know, Darren, in the past, if you look at 1997, Asia financial crisis, 2003, SARS, 2008, global financial crisis, and now 2019, uh, I mean, we just moved to 2020, but uh, this all started in 2019. Every time these things happened, everybody thought that uh, that was uh, the end of glory days for Hong Kong. But as you can see, after 1997, Hong Kong bounced back to become even more stronger. 2003, I can relate it to my own personal journey. In 2003, I came to Hong Kong, middle of SARS. And a lot of people thought that, what was I doing? Uh, But uh, for me, I thought that Hong Kong would always remain a very, very strong entity. It is a a great place to be. It's a place where uh, the market is very resilient. Uh, We have wonderful people out here. And I believed in that. And I came in middle of SARS and uh, Hong Kong absolutely bounced back after that. Same for global financial crisis, 2008, uh, Hong Kong being a major financial business hub. Uh, again, people thought that that would be uh, the end of it. But now here we are uh, bouncing back and doing extremely well. 
So similarly, we do believe that the current situation will in fact create new opportunities. It gives a trigger for Hong Kong to be more innovative, to connect with the uh, and look at businesses in a, in a new light, which happened again, as I said, in, in the last uh, few decades uh, at, from 1997 to 2003, 2008. And I've seen that myself uh, being out here. Another aspect, Darren, is that always look at the financial markets because financial markets always are a great indicator of uh, what the business confidence is in that particular place. So when I look at the numbers, for example, Hong Kong, as you know, was uh, the the num it beat Nasdaq to to have the IPO crown in 2019. 2019 uh, Hong Kong situation, what we are talking about, started pretty much in June, but in spite of that, Hong Kong got the maximum IPOs. Uh, PwC has just come out with a report which said that Hong Kong in 2020 would be raising 260 US billion dollars uh, in IPOs. So that shows you the confidence of the market. If you look at the Hang Seng Index, right, the stock exchange, uh, January 2019, it was at 25,000 points, around 25,000 points. January 2020, it's at 28,000 points. So you can see in spite of what's happening, the stock market actually grew. Uh, second January, when the markets opened 2020, it opened at 1.3% higher. So these are all indicators of that Hong Kong continues to be a, a strong economy. It continues to be a place where businesses are investing. And that's what we believe in, uh, that for students' perspective, uh, it continues to be a great place to come, understand business, learn business, understand the regional perspective, uh, get a hold of what's happening globally. And now, even more so relevant in a way, if you want to be a future leader, uh, you want to be in a place where there are different opinions, there are uh, certain elements which are beyond your control, because that what is what you as a leader should be uh, understanding and learning. So this situation, in our opinion, in fact, gives uh, a great platform for students to understand crisis management, to understand how uh, we need to uh, work with people from different opinions, how to look at a market which uh, may uh, will be bouncing back. So what are the opportunities which are connected to that? So uh, it's, it's, in my opinion, a great opportunity for those who are looking for uh, truly becoming a global leader. So yeah, that's what I would say about Hong Kong at the moment. We, we really and absolutely be believe in Hong Kong. Uh, it's a great place, very resilient place. Uh, and we do believe that uh, Hong Kong would continue to grow and, and be a strong economy. Yeah. And, and speaking of going through like uh, historic moments, right. literally, right? Like how how did that affect your your current class? Right. Like were, were classes uh, canceled for a little right. bit or right. yeah. How, how did that work? Just so Absolutely. our listeners have an idea. So Darren, at the peak of uh, what's been happening in Hong Kong, we just had a week uh, where we moved the classes to a more hybrid mode. That means uh, those students who felt that, hey, this was probably not the place to be in, we allowed them to take classes uh, on an on online mode. So we actually moved very quickly to move to a hybrid mode, as we call. Uh, but that was just for a week. And we were, and, and then we were back to our normal routine. See, another very, uh, the, uh, one aspect what's our students uh, have been talking about is that uh, our school is located in Sabah Port. It's a great location. You know, it's it's a kind of a location which is not, it's centrally located, but at the same time, uh, it is not middle of action to say so. And that definitely helps. But at the same time, we saw that our own students had such a confident uh, confidence in this particular location, in this, in in the whole idea of Hong Kong U's campus being uh, a place where they will like to continue to study. So we just had a, a week where uh, there were certain disruptions, but that's about it. Yes. Wow. So all the HKU, all the full-time MBA classes are held in Cyberport? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, all the core courses and everything is Cyberport. And uh, they need to, as I must have also talked about this in maybe earlier podcasts, uh, they are going to take certain 
elective certain courses with our part-time students because that interaction is a very very important interaction we want them to be with the middle level and senior executives uh, in this region uh, so that would be in the evenings at our town center in admiralty but again as i said it was just uh, probably a week when there was uh, uh, the classes could not be held but otherwise is been quite okay yes yeah, I mean, because my, my uncle actually lives close to Cyberport, so I know exactly right. that location. I've taken, you know, the, the public bus from Causeway Bay yeah. out to Cyberport. It's a really beautiful, serene location. Absolutely. Uh, I've walked through the campus myself, so I d actually didn't know all the MBA classes yeah. were held there. So that's yeah, that's good. All um, our, actually, all our master classes, so our MBA, okay. uh, our yep. uh, EMBA Global Asia, and our six specialized master programs are actually at uh, Cyberport. And what we have done, Darren, uh, about this, what we have done is uh, to, uh, you have seen, of course, you talked about the public transportation, but at the business school level, we actually have our own shuttle buses from Kennedy Town on a regular basis. So that really helps students because most of our students will stay in the Western District, as we call it, which is 15 minutes drive from Cyberport. And then we have our own campus buses, which keep shuttling between Kennedy Town and Cyberport. So uh, students feel that it's very easy and it's also convenient as such. Got it. Yeah. And Kennedy Town is an up and coming area too. And yeah. And then just my last question, you know, on, on the current events, sure. what else um, have you heard from your students, mm. you know, in terms of where they plan to be mm. after they graduate? Right. Like, has that affected their, their their plans to stay in Hong Kong and yeah. so forth? I actually, um, majority of them, and I was actually having uh, uh, talks during the uh, Christmas New Year uh, break. Uh, a lot of them were still in Hong Kong. Uh, since it's a short break, uh, many of them didn't go back to their respective countries. And I had an opportunity to catch up with them. And uh, actually, majority of them still want to be in Hong Kong. They see a great opportunity. Uh, they do believe that uh, Hong Kong will bounce back. And, and if you look around the world, Darren, if you look around the world, um, every economy has their own little issues. So, oh, it, sure. you know, it's not yeah. that, hey, let's go from, you know, from A to B and B is a bed of roses. Uh, not at all. So I guess for a lot of students, they believe that uh, that's why that Hong Kong is a place to be. Uh, because already they are here, they understand the ground realities better than somebody who is not here. Uh, so definitely they see a uh, value in being here. So a uh, majority of them are still definitely connected to Hong Kong. But at the same time, our own career services, uh, we have made certain adjustment to make sure that our students get even a better platform than what we provided probably in terms of reaching out to other regional places. So we are making more investing. Uh, I, I would say uh, uh, we are investing more in making sure that our students uh, have opportunities in places like Singapore, in Shanghai, in Beijing, in across the Greater Bay Area, because that's the one area which we are concentrating a lot on, because we do believe that Greater Bay Area is the future. And uh, that's why we believe that uh, our students have great opportunities out there. So when we look at the Greater Bay Area, you know, we, we are talking about tech, urban development, trade, innovation. I mean, these are the major, I would say, connector points for Greater Bay Area. So and then when you look at what's available, capital is available. I mean, you know, the government is involved. So naturally, there's a capital inflow of it. The infrastructure is there because we are talking about Hong Kong, Macau, Shenzhen, and then the Guangdong province, the, the Guangzhou greater area. So this together, uh, what we call the greater Bay area, the infrastructure is built. So what, what is needed? People. And that we believe is what our school is grooming our leaders towards. We are grooming the future managers and leaders. And a lot of our students look at this as a great opportunity. So Greater Bay Area, not just Hong Kong, would be our, I would say, where our students will be looking for opportunities and some brilliant opportunities in this part of the world. As I said, the capital is there, the infrastructure is there. What's now needed is people. And we do believe that uh, our school is best positioned uh, in a way to provide that part of the, of the puzzle. 
That's interesting. So you think that also more of your students would be interested in those those areas you mentioned, like tech, urban development, trade, logistics, of course, uh, as opposed to the traditional finance, uh, yeah. consulting, right. uh, marketing, where you know HKU always sends yeah. a big portion of its graduates. True. This is given, Darren. So these kind of <laughs> yeah. areas are yeah. given. So this definitely, yeah. want, when we have Greater Bay Area, uh, including, as I said, Hong Kong, Macau, Shenzhen, and, and Guangdong province, when that's the next huge stage of development, naturally financial services will play a very ro big important role. Uh, consulting will play an important work, role, but then tech is going to be another huge area. Innovation is going to be another huge area. And definitely we have also made certain structural changes in our curriculum or the way we are doing the China immersion program. And that will bring about, I would say, a little bit extra knowledge to our students connected to what's happening in the Greater Bay Area today and what will happen in the future. We really want our students to be future ready, not just what happened in the past, what worked in the past. Uh, yes, that's good to know and great, but then what's the future? So we are definitely making those changes to make sure that our students are future ready. And what about your international students, meaning say non-mainland Chinese, right. who, how are they, are, are they prepared and is there a need for them on the other side of the border, right? In mainland China, in that greater right. Pearl River Delta right. so area. So there would be there in some roles, which is needed for uh, our international students. But uh, my point being that the whole, uh, idea of Greater Bay Area is also to take Hong Kong to the next level in terms of its uh, it being a service provider, it being a very important element in this whole game plan of Greater Bay Area. So a lot of our international students will find those opportunities in Hong Kong, some of them probably in Shenzhen. And then, of course, uh, for our mainland students, uh, probably Shenzhen and Guangdong will and of course, Hong Kong would be a great place to be in. So we do believe that Hong Kong would play a very critical, uh, pivotal role in the development of Greater Bay Area. And that's where uh, our students will find brilliant opportunities. Got you. And then, yeah, let's... I also want to hear what, what's up. We're calling this segment "What's Up" with HKU. So, yeah, what 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 else is up with the, with the program? You know, what else is new? So, uh, as I, you know, let me connect a bit to what I've been talking about, which is uh, Greater Bay Area and how we are getting our students uh, future ready. So, uh, we changed our structure a bit, uh, Darren, from the last time we talked about. So, if you remember, our structure was one month in Beijing, then nine months in Hong Kong and then uh, around four months in either London Business School or Columbia University in New York or at Fudan University in Shanghai. So that was our, our structure for last uh, decade or so. But as I said, we have we figured out that the future, there'll be a great more opportunities in Greater Bay Area and also in other parts of China. So what we have done, we have changed the structure a bit. So now, the China Immersion Program is not like a, a separate program in Beijing only. So students actually start their MBA journey now in Hong Kong. And during this first nine months that they are in Hong Kong, uh, we will be uh, then taking these students to different parts of China to make sure that they are not just connected to one side of it, but to a larger set as such. So Greater Bay Area would play a very important role. So we'll be, in fact, the students will be investing their time in terms of going and understanding this region. So we'll be going and visiting from tech companies to financial services companies in the Greater Bay Area. We will uh, bring in experts to make them understand where Greater Bay Area is heading, how it connects to the greater economy of China and the world. Uh, so. We will also take them, of course, to Beijing and Shanghai because these are very important elements. So they are going to get more holistic idea about uh, how the Chinese economy works. So this is a, a bit of a change. So that means that during these nine months, they are not going to be like one month only in Beijing. They are going to be in Hong Kong. And then uh, we will take a couple of weeks to go to different locations, uh, immerse in those locations, understand those locations better. 
and of course, the last part remains um, uh, rock solid as what it was for the last decade or so, which is our students can then go to London Business School and be in London and have that global connection, uh, or they can go to Columbia Business School in New York. And if they want a, a more deeper understanding about China, Asia, uh, they can continue to be in Hong Kong or go to Fudan University in Shanghai, uh, who is uh, our uh, very close partner. So that is something a little bit change in structure, but we do believe that that makes us more relevant to what's happening in this part of the world. Yes. And I can't remember if we talked about this on our first podcast, but is there an application process to LBS in Colombia or Fudan? And, and how does that work? Right. Uh, not really. So see, that's the beauty of it, that it's not an exchange program because in an exchange program, uh, you know, you, you join the program and then you need to compete with your classmate. Maybe only one or two people can go to a specific school. So with us, when they apply for HK MBA, they can indicate uh, their preferences like, hey, I, my first preference is Colombia or second preference is London or first preference is London and or the first preference is Fudan. And then during the interview, we do talk about that and uh, to see what's the motivation, what's the fit like with each school. And then when they are offered admission, if they are offered admission, they would exactly know whether they're in the London track or Columbia track. And it's based on our conversation during the interview based on their choice. It's crystal clear. That's crystal clear. And is there, um, I was looking through your application right. and is there still an essay required? Uh, not really, because there's only one statement of purpose because we actually take a very in-depth interview and we believe that the yes. best way to judge a candidate is that we are talking to the candidate, we are speaking with the candidate, we are uh, connecting with the candidate, uh, you know, face-to-face -face or through Skype and so on and so forth. So that is a much better way to judge a candidate in our opinion. So mm -hmm. we, we don't uh, put emphasis too much on the statement of purpose or the essays. Yes. And is your interview process similar where you have the two rounds? Uh, yes, it would be for some candidate. It might be just one round, but for some candidate, it would be uh, two rounds. Uh, so, yes, the process and the kind of structure remains exactly this, uh, similar. Uh, and we are looking for similar things, what we talked about last time, you know, the yes. motivation and passion for Asia. And as I always keep saying that, be yourself, represent yourself the way you are. That would be the best way to match a school. Yes. And is there any other, you know, because last time we talked, you really mentioned, you made a, a very clear point to, that candidates really need to do the research to show their fit right, with True. the school and to be themselves, show that passion for Asia, True. Uh, that they're collaborative, that they, they think differently because you you want to bring together that diverse class. Absolutely. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if, yeah, if there's anything else or, or anything that candidates can do to make it easier for your office, right. for your admissions office, to see that it's a good fit. Right. 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 For both of you. How, how can they make it easy for you right. to do your job? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so Darren, I guess uh, one of the best ways forward for any candidate, uh, whether it's a job interview, whether it's, a, whether it's an admission interview, is to really understand the program or the job they're applying to. Because I think you can make it easier for the interviewer or you can show your intent towards the program in a better way when you are, you know, what you're getting into, what you're applying to. And this is something I would definitely, definitely uh, ask students to do. They need to understand what is our program about? Is this program suitable uh, for them? Or is some other program more suitable for them? Because everybody is doing MBA for a bit of a different reason. Not everybody is doing it for exactly the same reason. So you need to match your aspiration, your motivation of doing MBA with what a particular program offers. Now, if you look closely, every program will have a little bit different offering. It's a little bit different culture. Uh, the location plays a, 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 a critical role. Uh, then again, the uh, connections, what you're looking for plays a very important role. The overall reputation, recognition of that particular university plays a very important role. So decide for yourself what's more important, but how do you do that? That can be only done when you go deeper, you go and understand the program better. And when you do that, you're able to then represent yourself better. You can 
then uh, help the interviewer by showing that great fit between you and the program. So that's what I would say. Yeah, and I feel like one of the best ways to do that is to reach out to, to current students, right? Because then you can start to, to talk the language. Very you can true. literally talk you know, the same way they talk about the program, and it's almost like you already fit in. Um, how, how can uh, our listeners get in touch with your students? Oh, very easy. I think LinkedIn is a great platform. And of course, at the same time, I will also encourage uh, applicants to get in touch with the office. Uh, get in touch with us. We will be very happy to connect with our alums. We actually match alums who are coming from similar backgrounds, who have probably have a similar thought process. Uh, at the same time, we also connect with our, uh, our students. So as I probably have said in uh, some of the earlier podcasts, that uh, it's very important that the candidates interact and connect uh, with the admissions team uh, because that way you also know the culture of the school better you when you interact with the admission team you also get to know more about the programs you know not just what's put on the website or in the brochure uh, when you have a conversation the conversation leads to a little bit more in-depth information and that you can then also connect with the team in a way that the team will be then able to connect you with our students and alumni further so this is the way, the, the best way to, to, I would say, to go ahead with the admission process. Yeah, and, and I think that, you know, when a school like HKU or, you know, any top business school offers that sort of service that, you know, applicants need to take advantage of that because not all schools are able to do that. Right, true. Um, yeah, and, and so I also wanted to touch on careers one last time yes. and just ask you, you know, are, are, are there any sort of updates you've seen both from what the market is demanding and from, you know, what your your students yeah. are looking to do? Yeah, absolutely. That's, I have to ask this question every time we do an update pod. Absolutely. This is a, this is yeah. a very important consideration. Uh, I will break it down into two parts. One would be uh, the starting point, which is the knowledge point. So I will talk a bit about how we have made some changes starting this year in our core curriculum, because the knowledge, what our students are going to get also is going to be uh, reflected in the interviews and their connection with the companies uh, and in their future career. And the second part uh, would be, of course, the actual career services and student services support, which also leads to better opportunities. So let me talk about our core curriculum. So Darren, starting uh, this year, we have actually made a changes in the, our core courses. So we have kind of got in, we have, we have seen what the market is demanding. And some of our core courses now have changed to reflect that. So for example, now one of our core courses is high performing teams. Uh, you know, the value of a high performing uh, team has long been recognized. Teams drive organizational success, uh, yet forming, leading and nurturing high performance teams is very complex and is challenging. So we want to make sure that our students are well exposed to this they know how to explore different actionable uh, items uh, to leverage the best way to be a, a team player, but at the same time, be a leader and be a part of a high performing teams because a lot of organizations are looking for that. So that's one new course we have added. Uh, another new course we have added in our core curriculum is managing digital innovation. Uh, you know, the integration of technology, individual, and business processes uh, makes it really pertinent for managers and leaders of today and tomorrow to be able to understand and communicate the strategic potential of these, these digital tools across the entire value chain of an organization. I think in today's time, pretty much if you don't know digital innovation, you, pretty, you probably cannot get into any consulting job because most of the consulting jobs are connected to digital uh, innovation. Right. So we have made right. sure that this is a very core part of our curriculum. Uh, another course we have uh, put in our curriculum is executive leadership. Uh, because again, uh, high performing teams, leadership component, and connected to what's required of today's generation. So we have also made sure that uh, we we kind of connect with all shareholders and stakeholders. We connect with the theories part of it, of course. But at the same time, this course is uh, taught in a way that is more practical in nature. So through the high-performing teams and the executive leadership, we, we are able to 
manage that that soft skill part of it quite well. And then managing digital innovation is something which is definitely needed in today's time. And another course which we have, uh, it's not a new course, but we have made certain changes and made it more relevant to the market is analytics for manager. Uh, so, you know, as you know that, uh, again, students need these skill sets now. They need to manage data. They need to understand how to look at the data and how to make sense out of, out of it and how to actually use that data for business decisions. So analytics is again, uh, uh, I would say, uh, part and parcel of today's life. So we have made sure that our students have this kind of a knowledge. And of course, uh, of course, in elective courses also, last time we talked about uh, FinTech, mm, but we have taken it to the next level by adding artificial intelligence for business leaders. Uh, we have also added business intelligence and big data because that's a bit different in analytics. So again, people who want to be in, in companies which have uh, uh, maybe tech oriented or uh, very innovative, they need to do and understand uh, about the concept of business intelligence and big data. We also have introduced another new course on crisis management in a global business environment because it is the reality as if today. As we talked yeah, earlier, yeah. every economy, every business uh, has some form of other uh, which is, is going through a crisis. And we want our students, the future leaders, to be well aware of it. So crisis management uh, in a global business environment is actually taught uh, by industry practitioners. So these are the people who are actually running large businesses. These are the people who are handling these kind of crises uh, on a daily basis nearly in today's time. And they are coming in and, and, and teaching our students how to manage that. So uh, lots of such kind of uh, changes within the curriculum. So hopefully the knowledge part will also help in the career advancement in when they go for interviews, when they talk to the companies. Uh, we believe that our curriculum design is, is, is such that our students will be able to represent them very well. And the companies will see a value that they have the right knowledge for the jobs which are available in today's time, not yesterday, uh, not before. So that was the curriculum part of it. In terms of pure career services, Darren is becoming more and more personalized. So Hong Kong U, because our class size is small, we only take 60 students, right, for full time. We always had personalized service, but uh, we are trying to make it even more personalized in a way that we have realized that really every student coming in have a very different vision for themselves. Uh, they have very different skill sets. Uh, they have very different career thought and path to take. And that's why uh, we, have, uh, we are investing more and more uh, to make sure that it's a very personalized career journey. So we also at the same time are putting a lot of emphasis on the regional reach, not just Hong Kong or Singapore, but as I said, what we discussed, Greater Bay Area to a great extent. Uh, uh, and then at, at the same time, at Hong Kong U level, as you mentioned earlier, now I also look after the uh, specialized master program, EMBA Global Asia. So what we are also trying to do is to integrate a little bit more career services uh, orientation for the entire business school so that uh, we, we can connect with a larger set of companies. We have more numbers to offer to the companies and they can choose to come to the campus to choose a typical MBA student for uh, what we call it the early leadership uh, uh, kind of a position. But at the same time, for entry positions, we have the, the master students, the specialized master students. And of course, for the absolute leadership role, we have the EMBA students. So uh, that way, I think we are able to connect and relate to a, a larger number of companies. So that's happening on career services side, uh, more personalized, but at the same time, uh, more, I would say, integrated services within the HKU business school. The third component, which also helps students to probably get a, a personality which is more suited towards a particular kind of jobs or particular region, we actually have created a sub team within the program team, which whose whose only, I would say, outlook is student enrichment. So we always always had student services team. But within that, we have created another team which looks at student enrichment, uh, which goes be beyond just providing good services to the student. So they work with the students very closely uh, from making sure that we are invited for the best case study competition, making sure the student-led clubs 
are well funded and are well connected with the corporate world. Uh, so they help the students to interact with all the stakeholders in a better way. They also look at the, the basic facilities which are available to the students. So we have recently renovated our Cyberport campus and uh, we are also renovating our town center campus in Admiralty to provide a more, uh, oh, you know, uh, a kind of a classroom experience and the lounge experience was student lounge experience, which is more connected to today's generation. Uh, you know, Darren, probably my generation. What, what is that? What is today's generation? I think they like more open spaces. They really, so yeah. it's like the, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a cultural thing what a lot of companies are also doing, right? They are knocking down the wall. They're making it more open. So it's similarly, that's what we have done to, to kind of replicate what they would be doing in a real life in after the MBA. So similarly, the facilities are, are, are structured towards that. And we do believe that such enhancement from all levels, whether it's, it's the knowledge part of it, which is the curriculum, uh, or the the actual career services part of it, the direct uh, career services part of it, or the student enrichment form of it. Together, this will help our students find better opportunities and be more future ready, as I as I say. Yeah, and I really want to circle back to you know the specialized master programs. We'll talk about that in a right. bit. But uh, one question I had is. When you say that your career services are very personalized, right. like what 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 does that mean right. for the, the the student? Like, does that yeah? How how is that reflected in in that experience? Yeah. So uh, the starting point is we just take sixty students. That means Dryan, each and every student is so well known to each member of the career services. They exactly know their background, what their journey is about, what what are they looking for in depth because we have account managers who look after a uh, very few students. So that means probably one account manager may look after only five students. So it's imagine what happens in a, in a business scenario where uh, maybe uh, you have a relationship manager in a bank or you have an account manager in a, uh, in a, in a large company who look after a certain accounts. So it's a similar model where uh, the account manager, they look after a small set of students and that's why they know them really well. They're able to reach out to them, uh, connect with them much faster. You're not student number 244 to say so. Uh, everybody knows you. Uh, that's one. Second, uh, so uh, a lot of schools will do large workshops uh, connected to career services, uh, you know, from CV workshop to personality development to market review workshops and all that. We do few of them, but at the same time, we do a lot of one-to-one -one coaching. I think that's very unique to, to us and to our school. So we actually sit down, the coach will sit down with a particular student and go through the, this, what in other schools, what probably uh, it's on a workshop format. We do some workshops, don't get me wrong. Uh, we need to do certain workshop at a for the whole class because they need to interact with each other but then our emphasis is to a great extent doing one-to-one -one, uh, coaching i think that makes a huge difference that's what i call the personalized uh, kind of way of doing things so even when we talk about reaching out to the companies and organization uh, we go more in depth we talk to the companies we really understand what their requirement is and then we make sure that the right set of people are uh, then recommended to that company so that well, what we have seen is that uh, the conversion rate is much higher this way so this is what right. i meant by personalized service right and so are those career services uh, staff members and team are they like organized by say industry expertise right, right. It, is that how it works so yes. so if five students are interested in, in consulting right. they would be kind of assigned to the consulting expert or how does that work yes you're right so we have in fact hired people who are who used to work in in different sectors and industries from consulting to financial services to working in even startups and so on and so forth so definitely uh, we do have uh, account managers what we call or the career services team which come from very diverse uh, backgrounds and then of course depending upon their speciality uh, they would be uh, talking and connecting with the students who are who want to be in that particular field. So definitely that helps. And then of course, uh, again, because it's a small class size, each one of them is able to get a mentor 
uh, a mentor is somebody who's very senior executive in a field they want to get into. So we spend the first couple of months understanding what the student wants, where they want to go. And then we have a large pool of uh, very senior mentors uh, who have uh, who've been very nice and you know they're very humble to get connected with the school, to give back to the society. And these are the people who will be then again paired up with somebody uh, who's very senior in a field they want to be in. And that also helps them get a better idea about that particular industry, uh, their own, these mentors' own personal journey of reaching this position and so on and so forth. So a lot of such tools and uh, uh, connections are available. Yes. And, you know, when you're talking about the changes you've made with the curriculum and the core curriculum and highlighting some of your electives, right. have you seen the last corporate recruiter survey by G by the GMAC yes, Council? absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, it's just funny because I just want to share this with our audience, but the top three things that were mentioned as most important skills for recent business school graduates were problem solving, number one. Right. Number two, working with others. Yes. Number three, data, al data analysis and interpretation. Sure. And number four, uh, communication and presentation skills. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, it sounds like, yeah, like those classes are really, you know, matching those needs combined with that knowledge of digital innovation, as you mentioned, analytics. But yeah, I mean, solving problems and working with others. Yeah. Right. That's, that's really important. That's why we put on the high performing teams, because yeah. this is all about, yeah. you know, problem solving, working with others, making it happen. Uh, yeah. And uh, and then the executive leadership takes it to the next level as such. So definitely these uh, courses help our students uh, tremendously uh, to be very market ready. And another uh, probably uh, what, what we have done maybe adds to the whole dimension is lifelong learning. So this is something new again, Darren. So we have introduced lifelong learning. That means our alums, whether they are for MBA, whether for EMBA or for the six ma uh, master specialized master program, uh, once they become an alum, they can come back and take electives uh, for no cost. And this is great because we want our community to be well connected uh, with the with today's business. That means, say, somebody who graduated eight years back probably didn't learn uh, about uh, artificial intelligence for business or fintech for that matter. Now they can come back and take those courses with us. So every year we will release a certain number of courses uh, which are newly introduced and we'll uh, open it up for our alumni. This also helps the alums to connect with the current batch of students because they are in the same class now. Uh, of course, they meet on a social occasion. We have the buddy system. So they meet alums and students meet each other in the buddy system or in during the social interaction. But uh, taking classes together uh, adds to another way of interacting very closely. So this has been another new addition and our, our students and alums have, uh, they love this new addition. So we hope it will also help uh, for the community to come together. Yeah, I just want to, to give you guys props and kudos for that. I mean, I think, I think just a personal opinion of mine, if I have the soapbox for a second, is just that, yeah, what is, you know, a master's degree these days, right? Right. Uh, one year, two years, is that really enough? No, we're all, you and me too, Sachin. Yes, we have yes. to continually update ourselves. Absolutely. And so I think, especially with the premium price that these business schools are charging, I just feel, you know, yes. offering that those classes for free, whether they're online, in person, to alumni, should be required of all these schools, you know? And yes. it's it's only good for, yes. for the business schools as well. Uh, so I, yeah. I uh, really think that's fantastic Absolutely. that you guys are doing that. Yes, and you know, uh, Darren, what we have done, we have introduced a lot of our electives on a block mode, specifically, so keeping in mind that a lot of our alums might not be any longer in Hong Kong. Uh, right. But that's right. why, so they can just come in on a Thursday. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, four days, and they can actually finish one course. So we have also introduced these kind of block electives. They are good for part-time students or part-time MBA students as well. They can take a couple of days leave and then, you know, they can finish one elective. But also it helps in our our continuous education, what we talked about, lifelong learning. Uh, our alums from different parts of the world 
can then think of, hey, let me go to Hong Kong. Also, I get to meet some friends, uh, you know, uh, the community. But at the same time, I can also sit in and probably do a, a course on a digital innovation or on, on something new, which I missed uh, some time back or uh, something which I now need in my job. So uh, these initiatives, we, we really, really hope would add a new dimension. Yeah, so let's let's uh, shift the focus a bit to your portfolio of programs that you have at at HKU, uh, you know, and that you're you're overseeing. So, one question I have, and it's a question we get a lot from people who come to Touch MBA, is where should I go? Right? Which which type of program should right. should I look at? And of course, you know, there's there's the obvious markers, kind of length of experience. Right. right, but right. I think the questions tend to come at the borders, yeah. right? Yeah. So, like, yeah. I'm someone with uh, eight years of experience. Should I do the MBA right. or the EMBA? I'm someone with, <clears throat> you know, one or two years of experience. Should I do the master's programs right. or the the MBA? So, True. I'm wondering how <laughs> you know what you tell yeah. your prospective applicants, and because right. obviously you want to help them the best Absolutely. you can. So. Absolutely. Uh, very true, Darren. I mean, that's one question we also hear from so many of our applicants as to which of the programs is most suitable for you, for, for us, and especially keeping in mind uh, those who are on the border, as you rightly said. So we always advise students to, to have a better vision uh, for themselves. So for example, if there's somebody with just two years experience, for that person, both specialized master and a full-time MBA is, is something that person can apply. But the question we ask, always ask them is that, do you want to specialize? Do you want to go deeper into a particular area? Like, for example, if you believe that, hey, uh, you know, I love data analytics and this is what something I want to pursue at least for the next five to eight years window, uh, then definitely we recommend them to do a master's program. A master's is business data analytics because they want to go deeper into it. That's the line of functionality they love and they want to get into. But when the same person tells us that, yeah, you know, yes, I do like uh, data analytics. That's what I've done for the last two years. But I want to get a broader spectrum of the how the business works because that is, I don't want to go that deep. I need to, yes, I want to touch upon it, but at the same time, I need to understand the larger spectrum of business. Then for that kind of a person, we will suggest an MBA because it gives a more, much more broader perspective. It focuses on soft skill development and a little bit more leadership development uh, than as compared to the specialized master. So again, people need to understand and define their own objective as to who they are and what they want to be. So that will then give them a, a, a clearer picture as to which of the two programs are better. But at the same time, when you look at the other border, which is, hey, do I do full-time MBA or do I do EMBA, right? Now, uh, EMBA is for those who have all, already reached a certain leadership position. So uh, everybody looks at their career in a different way and everybody's trajectory is very different. So there might be somebody with eight years to 10 years experience, and that will be a borderline case for EMBA, uh, but that would be a, a proper uh, kind of a work experience for a, a, a good full-time program. So again, it would depend upon what are you trying to achieve and where, how have you spent those eight to 10 years? If those eight to 10 years have not been in real leadership positions where you have handled a large team or you have handled business worth X, uh, million dollars or you have not looked after larger geographies then i would still say that a full-time mba would be better it's still nuts and bolts and it gives you that knowledge it gives you that confidence to then uh, take up uh, that high level job but somebody who's already done that uh, what we call the early achievers to say so then the emba will be much better because emba is a part-time program so you can continue to engage in what you're doing your company will support you not uh, financially, that's not, not that what I mean, but uh, time-wise, because you're an important person in the in the organization. So that's why they will allow you to, hey, okay, go. You have to fly in, fly out of different locations for EMBA program. So that's how you differentiate as to where you are, what have you done, and where you want to be. 
what you want to do. That's very important. And then you determine whether it's a specialized master program, which is more suitable. You can dive deeper, become an expert of that because a lot of companies are looking for that. But at the same time, are you an MBA type? who is looking for a more leadership position, who is looking for a uh, uh, you know, more diverse portfolio as such, or you're somebody who's a, who has done well you know, quite early in life, you was an early achiever, you have worked in different geographies, handled a larger team or larger portfolio of clients, and then maybe EMBA would be much better for you because you've already reached a certain stage in your career and you're now moving to the next level of leadership. So this is how we define different programs, and uh, that's how we advise people. Now, that is such great advice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I have one more sure. kind of borderline case. So uh, let's take that example of um, someone who's really into, say, data analytics or marketing, right, right. which are two of your, your specialized master right. programs. Do recruiters, are they looking for someone who has – taken you know more data uh data analytics courses more marketing courses shown more expertise there mm. um, when they're recruiting mm. because like really right that's i think that's what a lot of applicants are thinking about when they right. when they're coming out of the program what's going to give them more of an edge right. so they definitely need to know whether they want to spend significant amount of time in that industry right, right? right. but you know because the mba gives them perhaps a broader skill set yeah so what what is actually more employable, mm. you know, for those borderline cases? That's right. that's yeah. a tough question. That's that's absolutely a tough question, and that's where you need to connect that to your core personality. So mm. uh, I will define it. Mm. Uh, like for example, let's stick to the marketing example, right? So if you come with two years of say, again, a bit of a marketing experience, say you work in in an advertising agency, but then your aim is to become a brand manager. Uh, uh, move on towards the uh, large organization, whether it's a consumer company or a tech company, but more in a pure marketing role. Then I would, and then you think your personality is very suitable to be uh, a marketing person. You you love consumer psychology. You love interacting people. Then probably uh, doing a master's program in marketing would be more desirable because you can then really become specialized with that. So. Your personality will define that a lot. And your, again, as I said, your career goal, because you see yourself in marketing for uh, at least a short term, a short to middle term. But then there would be, say, another person who comes with the same experience, two years in advertising agency, but understands that their skill sets can be transferable. That means they are not looking for pure marketing role as such, but they want to use their client facing experience in advertising agency or uh, working across different brands and uh, interacting within different industry to probably move towards more marketing slash business development slash more uh, client facing kind of a role, then probably MBA for that person will be better because that person is not looking for pure marketing as such. And also that person is saying, hey, you know what, let me do this for next three years post MBA. And after that, Probably it will be a good time when I get when I have five to six years experience, probably move towards something, something else, because so there are all different personalities and different people with different skill sets and a vision for themselves or that would define which program is better for them. So it's really very important for people to have a better understanding themselves about who they are and at least have, I, I would say, medium term goals and then decide which of the two uh, sets of programs will be better. I mean, what do you what do you tell applicants who say, well, the average starting salaries of your MBAs right. are higher than the average starting salaries of right. uh, you know, specialized master programs right. in, in these industries? Right. So for those borderline cases which qualify for both, my answer to them always is that if you do well in your career, if you follow your instinct, if you follow your skills, if you follow something you're good at, the money will come automatically because if you do well, you move up faster and then that gap is taken care of within the first three years. Uh, you know, So that's how one has to look at their career because initially, if you just keep looking only at, hey, what am I going to get? What, uh, you know, what's my salary going to be? That may be a, kind of a, not the right me metrics or parameter to choose. I would say, look at your medium term, term career 
uh, growth as such. So when, when you do something which you truly enjoy, you have the right skill sets for, you know, this is going to be something which you are going to do well in because you have the skill sets, you have the interest, you have the motivation for that, then you can move up the ladder faster than trying to get into something because, hey, that pays me more at this stage, but hey, you may not be the right candidate for that. So that's right. how I look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, uh, I totally get where you're coming from, but I think as a, as an applicant, yeah. it might sound counterintuitive, <laughs> right? They're like, True. you know, I'm, I'm paying so much money for this tuition. Like yeah. I just want a high paying job. That's what I want. Yeah. But, um, yeah, if you can think, like you said, medium term and kind of chart out, yeah. you know, know yourself and chart out your path that way. True. What um, we've seen, you know, I've seen so many batches that we have, you know, been in this business for a long time. Uh, I would say the most successful people who have been who have been able to chart out their career. They they have been, you know, they, these are the people who had some vision for themselves about uh, after they come out of the business school or where do they see themselves in five years. So uh, kind of a three year window, and then after three years, another two year window. So altogether, say five years. And mm. what I've seen is our alums who are doing really really well are the people who had a little bit of a thought connected to this. And I would still encourage people that have that thought, you know, try to understand your own personality, your own uh, real interest, what you like. Uh, and then when you go through the program, uh, try to get knowledge about that particular industry, that particular functionality, and then plan a bit more medium termish. And that would be a best way to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. And do you guys use the career leader assessments um, at HKU? No, 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 we don't. We no. Don't. Yeah. So I think that's one good resource um, for our listeners, uh, career leader. It just helps you match your, your interests and skill almost in an inventory style against, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who have taken oh, nice. that survey. So it's super useful. And I'll, I'll provide a link to that in the show notes. But I agree with you 100%, Sachin. Uh, and I love that tip of like having that three to five year vision. That's a good hint there. But uh, just to close out sure. uh, the episode, I, I wanted to take one step back even further sure. and just ask you as someone who has been in this industry, you know, for for so long and made such an impact and g gotten an MBA yourself. Right. Like, how do you feel about how business education is changing? Right. Right. Because. I mean, let's face it, like the, the prices at HKU, they're premium prices, right? For yes. the degrees. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and so, you know, when there's so many different alternatives out there, True. you know, it might sound like heresy on the Touch MBA podcast, but I truly believe that True. people need to, to find their own path, right? And decide whether the MBA is worth it for them or a master's in data analytics is yep. worth it for them. And sometimes you can level up doing, you know, through other avenues now. Right. I mean, there's absolutely. so much out there. Absolutely. So I, I, I think um, there's been a lot of talk about how this, our, our space is evolving. Right. And, and I just would love to hear your yep. thoughts on kind of where you see the, the future of business education moving. Right. So definitely the specialized masters are one of the, I would say, uh, one of the things which has come up in the last uh, couple of years, more so because of the requirement of the business education to evolve uh, as many companies have indicated that they need different types of people so i think earlier the emphasis of business school was to only create uh, more uh, people with a more general skill sets more business knowledge overall uh, having that leadership skill having that approach towards hey let me go and get this thing done you know a typical mba emba kind of a connotation i guess the, the change has already taken place where the companies have realized and they have made sure the business schools realize that there's a need for different types of people. There is a high need for people with very specialized uh, skill sets, but at the same time, there will be always a need for making sure there is a set of people who have a, a larger spectrum of uh, knowledge about business. They have a you know more helicopter view, what we call about the business, they, they can connect on different notes of different industries and so on and so forth. So for business school, it's very critical 
that we understand the, the requirements. We understand that there's a need for different types of personalities, different types of knowledge, and we adapt accordingly. We adapt that we don't feel that, oh, if we put a lot of efforts into a master program, a specialized master program, are we taking away the advantage of an MBA? Not at all. There is a market for uh, all types of things. You know, it. let me connect that to the reality of business. Uh, when when people uh, 10 years back said, no brick and mortar business will, will survive. Uh, it will be online. Everything will be online. Uh, here we are a decade later, uh, brick and mortar business still survives. It, it still has its great value. It's just that, the both brick and mortar and online business have become complementary to each other. It's the, the best companies are those who are able to kind of have a good combination of the traditional side of the business, but at the same time moving uh, with what uh, the new generation wants and what is the requirement of uh, today's time given all the tech advances. So I would say the same thing for business school. They have to understand and continue to grow or what they're traditionally very well known for but at the same time, make certain adjustment and changes in that to make sure that it is connected to today's time, today's requirement. But at the same time, introduce new way of thinking, new way of doing things like the specialized master programs. And then somehow have a good marriage between the two to make sure that you are then making sure that you are connected to the realities of the world and your students are future ready. That's what I would say. Yeah. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end our conversation. Sachin, this is podcast number three that we've done. I think you're the most, uh, you're the guest I've had on the show the most. Oh, okay. <laughs> Touch Thank, you. Podcast. Thank you for that. I, I should send, yeah, I need to send you something like how YouTube sends people uh, <laughs> like, you know, plaques to put on the wall or something. But no, thank you again for sharing the updates on the program and giving us some insights and your opinions on, on, on what's going to happen I really appreciate it. And it's always, always fun to do these. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. Hi guys, Darren here. Two things I wanted to mention before the end of this episode. The first is that HKU has six specialized master programs, and those are in business analytics, accounting, economics, finance, global management, and marketing. I also want to mention the resource that I told uh, Sachin about. It's called the Career Leader Assessment, and it was developed over 20 years ago by the Director of Career uh, Services at, at Harvard Business School. And I think it's just a great assessment to take while you're applying, or I should say before you start applying to B-School, but also if you just want a better grasp of what your strongest interests, motivators, and skills are. So if you just Google career leader assessment, you can go to their uh, homepage and you can take that assessment for, I believe it's 95 US dollars now. Uh, we can get you a $10 discount on that assessment. So if you click on the link in the show notes of this episode, we can help get you uh, that same test for $10 less. Okay, we'll see you guys next time on the Touch NBA podcast. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up. And we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. See you soon.